Welcome to the third season of The Coaching Cast, your working from home manager's club. Regardless of where you are working right now, at home, in the office, or a blend of both, or whatever you do as a career, we've got something for you here at The Coaching Cast. I'm Lisa, founder of Grip Corporate Coaching, personal performance coach, leader, and chief eye roller when it comes to all nonsensical corporate mumbo jumbo, which suffocates rather than advocates. And I'm Susie, sales and business coach at Future You Business Coaching, currently taking on my hardest coaching assignment to date, still parenting that toddler who doesn't take too kindly to being questioned. In this podcast, we aim to explore the leadership and coaching techniques required to navigate and survive the current business environment, presenting different topics each episode, which we will discuss with some special guests along the way, sharing ideas, hints and tips for you to take away and try for yourself. We hope you enjoy listening. In today's episode, we welcome performance coach Sally Hanna to the coaching cast to discuss her passion and experience in supporting working mothers to get ahead in their careers without sacrificing their families. Stay with us and enjoy. So before we get into our discussion with Sally, Suze, how's your week been? Hellish. (laughs) (laughs) Hellish. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. Tell me more. Tell Um, me more. Share with our listeners. Oh, oh. So, (laughs) um, so last week. I took the week off work um, to spend some time with the familia, so with my family. We decided to go away um, to a well-known caravan park on the east coast of Yorkshire. So uh, we went and stayed at Haven. Other caravan park establishments are available. Um, And really looking forward actually to uh, having a bit of time off a bit of a week away it's been quite a busy summer uh, loads of great stuff happening but it has just been busy and obviously working and um my little boy on in the run-up had been a bit unwell and I've obviously had which I've talked about in the podcast before some other kind of physical health challenges this year so kind of looking forward to a break and to a holiday um, so the first few days were absolutely fine. We had a really nice time together. Um, and then my little boy developed chicken pox on day three, day four. And it just went tits up from that point. <laughs> like, it was hell. It was so intense. And we were in this, cooped up in this bloody caravan. You can't go anywhere because we can't use any facilities, like can't go swimming, can't go to the playground. Um, so we're just kind of, I spent like, I don't know, like days it felt like just driving around with him in the car. Like it's beautiful scenery, like really nice places to go. Oh God. So anyway, we cut the holiday short, came home. Um, so that was not ideal he is now on the road to recovery so thankfully he's he is okay and I'll take that but you know when you just kind of I saw the spots and he was so unsettled and I was just like mate we've literally just come out of the back of kind of two illnesses and now this is your third in six weeks like what the hell like two-year-olds I think are just obsessed like they just oh there's just so many germs and stuff going around at the moment so it's, it was hard work it was really hard and then one day in particular was incredibly hard because he was just so unsettled and obviously we weren't at home um so I had quite a tough day with him and I thought uh, so I wasn't on bedtime my husband was so I was like right I'm gonna go and have a go to the walk for a walk so I'm gonna walk to the beach um on like site just have like half an hour to myself and then I decided to pick up some chips on the way home. So I went to the fish and chip shop on the caravan site. And I don't know really what happened, but fundamentally a woman, an older woman, older than me, decided to pick a fight with me over some chips. And I was knackered. I was done in, right? I was just, I was done. I'd had enough. And literally, I don't think she really expected my reaction, which was like, come on then, like, bring it on. 
like I am and I do not advocate violence and I do not advocate physical fighting but I was I'd reached my limit and you just don't pick a fight with a tired pissed off mum and I was just literally <laughs> like all right yep yeah, what do you, what 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 do you want to happen now then yeah bring it on like <laughs> anyway basically what happened was this woman and her husband went massively like extreme um swearing kicking off because the ch- they'd waited 35 minutes for some chips which I don't even know how you end up waiting 35 minutes. Why have you not gone in and asked the way chips are? Anyway, yeah, yeah. this is the other type of like moronic people that were obviously I was dealing with. And they were really rude, really overly aggressive. And they were swearing at the person behind the counter. So oh I just God. stepped in and just said like, and also I'd reached my limit, my personal limit for the day. I was done. So I just turned, I was like, enough. I was like, stop what you are saying. Like, take it down like enough like do not speak to them like that it's not needed so then they started to try and pick a fight with me and I was like bring it on <laughs> absolutely bring it on because I could do with getting some like pen of emotion out <laughs> to be honest <laughs> my holiday has gone tits up yeah and I'm tired um so anyway we didn't end up having a physical fight um but we uh yeah and I got some free chips out of it because I stood up for the other person so there is a there is a kind of <laughs> yes there is a, you know, a positive there. And there's a, a story there about, you know, sticking up when things for other people, when things aren't right. And you know that that's not right, but flipping heck, I could have like done without it. But, um, oh, see. and I was like, oh, yeah, so I've had you. quite an intense week. I'll be totally honest. So yeah, I was pretty done in oh. uh, and my poor husband as well. Like he had a week off work and just spent most of it or half of it just obviously same as me just dealing with a very tired emotional unsettled poorly little toddler oh god well there we are there we are people Susie standing up for fish and chip shops all across the country (laughs) yep (laughs) ensuring that you get your chips in a pleasant respectful environment environment. so yes maybe this is your new niche your new coaching niche you can support all those fish and chip shops staff members make yeah. sure that the general public has a pleasant experience when receiving their chips absolutely so yeah any of my friends out there who have um previously met assertive Susie <laughs> she's quite assertive but when pushed to the limit I'd say assertive assertive Susie came out <laughs> and that is next level <laughs> oh well, I'm sorry that your holiday was. Thanks. Anyway, how are <laughs> you? Yeah, I'm absolutely fine. I've got nothing to nothing to contribute in respect to that story. <laughs> but honestly, yeah, quite an uneventful week for me. It was quite chilled, actually, so I apologise. I won't dwell on that because I feel like that's me being quite smug, considering <laughs> you had the opposite and you're the one that actually went away, not me. So let's move swiftly on before you get assertive Susie out and start having a go at me. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Today we welcome Sally Hanna, performance coach specialising in supporting working mothers. Sally made her transition from medicine to performance coaching three years ago and founded Cotswold Coaching Clinic just before the pandemic struck. Despite COVID-19, she has successfully built up a coaching practice in which she supports professional working mothers to get ahead in their careers without sacrificing their family. Her passion for enhancing women's quality of life, especially working mothers, comes from having transformed her own life and seeing the ripple effect of those on those around her. Welcome, Sally, to the coaching cast. It's lovely to have you here. Hello. Thank you for having me. Yeah, welcome, Sally. I'm so excited to speak to you today, especially because I'm a working mum myself. (laughs) And after my week last week, I can't wait to talk to you about some (laughs) potential hints and tips (laughs) for balancing motherhood and working life so uh, it's really lovely to have you here today um so we thought we would um kick off with just a little bit of an introduction into um your background and yourself for our listeners so I know you used to be um a doctor before Mm -hmm. moving into coaching that's quite a transition uh, (laughs) from a career perspective tell us a little bit more about how that came about sure um it's quite funny the, the number of people that say oh that's a, a really odd move actually from a from skill set point of view it's really seamless so I used to work as a GP and um, 
you know, my days would be spent listening to patients, um, asking relevant questions, looking for that hidden agenda, you know, what, what is it that they're too embarrassed to bring up, too scared to bring up? What is it that's going to, um, you know, impede the medical management plan that I want for them? Um, and actually, those are all the skills that we use in coaching every day. So actually, in terms of a skill set transition, it, it was quite easy. What wasn't easy um, was making that decision to leave medicine and go to coaching. That that really was not easy. That was full of so many ups and downs. And ironically, I didn't even know what coaching was at the time. And if I did, and I had had a coach, I'd have worked through the ups and downs and the confusion and the loss of identity and all the negative emotions that you have to experience when you're when you're making such a transition. I could have made that so much more um, effectively and efficiently. But it, as it happened, I you know, um, it took me 18 months to finally come to the conclusion that I was actually leaving medicine. And um, yeah, I mean, I guess when I finally made it, uh, made that decision, actually sort of signed up to the coaching diploma, it was just such a weight lifted. It's liberating, really, really liberating to just make a decision. Doesn't matter if it's right or wrong, just making a decision and starting out on a path and you can always course correct if it doesn't work <laughs> out. Um, but it is, I guess that's my biggest learning point for me and my children and everyone that I coach. That it doesn't really matter if it's right or wrong. You can always course correct, but you've just got to get on a path rather than keep going around that roundabout, which is how I felt I was yeah. just forever reflecting and questioning and berating myself. And yeah avoiding people because I didn't want that question um what are you doing now what are you doing next you know it was it was hard work and painful but yeah in terms of um in terms of the transition with regards to the work itself that was that was easy (laughs) okay so was there anything in particular which I suppose triggered you to think I need to transition now onto a different path so I hadn't been happy in medicine for a very long time. And actually, I have a, a background of having done lots of moves within medicine itself. So, okay. um, you know, I used to be a hospital physician, um, did all the exams for that, then realized that wasn't for me. Thought, oh, OK, maybe primary care is more my thing. Moved into that, did all the exams for that, worked in that Um really realized that that wasn't the thing for me and actually another another vital lesson there is I made the move into general practice to accommodate a family life because it would be the the hours would be more convenient and location wise would be more convenient you know at the time I was up in Glasgow my husband-to-be was in London it wasn't really a way to start a family So it made sense to transition to something like general practice, which was much more accommodating of family life. I knew deep down it wasn't really where my interest within medicine lay, but at the time I genuinely believed it didn't matter and, you know, it it will pay the bills and I would Mm -hmm. be so happy being married with kids that it doesn't really matter what I do to earn money. How wrong could you be? (laughs) (laughs) So, um, Yes, I did. I did general practice for about seven years. And actually, the reason what triggered leaving wasn't my own choice, really. I, I you know, I, it was a crossroads. The surgery was closing and I had an opportunity to rethink the path. Um, but I genuinely believe if the surgery didn't close, I'd be sat here moaning to you about general practice and how much I don't enjoy my job. Right. So actually, I was... It was an opportunity that came up and courage that made me think, you know what, let's try something different and just see where it goes. I was petrified. Don't get me wrong. I was absolutely petrified. But I guess the the real desire to want something different just tipped the balance yeah. and gave me enough courage to think, you know what, let's let's just go for this. But it, again, that wasn't um, that wasn't overnight. You know, I. I had planned another job to go to. I had taken a couple of months out before starting this new job. Um, But in that couple of months, I'd experienced life as every working mother would love to have experienced life, you know, actually seeing more of their kids, having a relationship with their husband, feeling fulfilled in other aspects of life. Um, 
And I just, I just couldn't bring myself to go back to general practice. So I, I had to ring and say, I'm, I'm not taking up the job offer. Um, and then that started the process of self-doubt and all sorts of, you know, if I'm not a doctor, what am I? Mm. Um, my entire identity was tangled up in what I did, not who I was as a person. Yeah. And I really struggled, really, really struggled. And we live in quite a small community. There's lots of people asking lots of questions all the time. And, you know, I just wanted to be able to understand what was going on in my head um, without feeling like I needed to put on a show for people. Um, so I really needed that space to reflect and understand. And uh, I don't think I was necessarily in the right place for that. Um, but uh, got there in the end. Um, and it was just by chance, you know, lots of internet searching about, you know, what do doctors go on to do if they're not doctors? Okay. You know, and I, was, I, was for, I was forever searching and thinking, what can I do? I, I started that the common- process. I know. Google <laughs> good old Google you know I, I signed up I started an application form to study law and then changed my mind I, I bought textbooks to study um, uh, medical defense and then changed my mind nothing nothing felt right um, but it was good to experiment with all of these things um, and then eventually I came across this weekend to to try out you know coaching um in London and everything just literally fell into place after the first talk I just realized that actually these were the skills that I had the this was the part of medicine that I did enjoy yeah um which was really sort of going deep with patients and extracting what the real issue was and the problem is the NHS isn't set up to allow you to do that you know I wanted to be able to give patients so much more of my time but the NHS isn't set up that way it doesn't have the resources to do that and if you're a doctor who tries your hardest to give everybody else time despite the constraints of the system you end up going home at nine o'clock at night you don't see your kids you don't put them to bed yeah. it's exhausting and, and the only outcome is burnout so yeah. um it really wasn't it wasn't for me I can, you know, 100% relate back to the piece you just talked about there, which was around, you know, thinking about your your career path that you were on and thinking about how does this work now I am a mum? Because I had a very much similar experience in the sense of a different career sector. Obviously, I'm not a medically trained professional, <laughs> um, but I um, worked in London. I live in Cheshire. I was commuting every week. Um, I was working long hours. I was staying away from home. Um, It had a life cycle and it served me so, so well up until that point where I had children. And I knew that deep down that that path that I had been on had been amazing, but it wasn't going to be able to work in the lifestyle and also in the parent that I wanted to be with my son. Um, And I... When I was pregnant, actually, and uh, when I was on maternity leave, um, and I was on maternity leave during the pandemic. So we've talked about this before. I did a lot of walking on the pand- um, during the pandemic with the pram. This is how this podcast was born. Um, you know, and I did a lot of reflecting and thinking in that time, like, you know, how am I going to transition my career onto a different path from sales? And I knew I wanted to be a coach and take my commercial experience and, and put that into a different way. And what you talked about there just really resonated with me about having that courage to trust your instinct and also trust yourself that actually it will come at the right time for you. And you just have to believe if that's what you want to do, that you will be able to make it. And it's scary. Like I remember being like really scared when the day actually came where I left the organization I'd been with for nearly 12 years. Um, stepping into that unknown is is really scary and I think even more so when you have a child like you mentioned there your I about your identity you go through so much change when you when you bring a child into the world and your world is turned upside down and so is an element of who you are it has to be because you have someone else you have to think about so much and you know it can very easily be um kind of all tangled together I think you know that changing working 
life, that change in terms of your personal life and you're now a parent, and then just the general upheaval of having a newborn and facilitating this new path that you're on. And when when they collide, you know, it's a it's a lot to process and untangle. So I can totally relate to how you may have felt at that time. Um, because I felt something very similar, I think. And I think you need to add into the mix it's not only are you going through physical changes, emotional changes, psychological changes when you become a mother, um, there is what really complicates it and it comes out in coaching women all the time it's society's expectations Mm. of what the perfect working mother is Mm. and it's very very easy when you're living in the fast lane as we all are to not take that time out and think am I actually doing this because I want to do this or am I doing this because this is what people do Mm. this is you know and and it's 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 your default setting because everyone around you is doing it there's an expectation to do it um we all want to belong we all want to fit in um we don't all have the time or the courage to deal with uncomfortable emotions so it's just easier to suppress things and just go with the flow and you know that will work for many people for a certain period of time and and for that that is for everybody that will be different but at some point everyone will reach you know um a stage where they they start asking themselves questions and whether that's because it's forced like it was for me you know I had a a, a, an opportunity with with the surgery closing to stop and think Mm. or whether that's because actually they've worked themselves into the ground and they're now ill and they're signed off work Mm. they're burnt out and they've been forced to think um you know um or they have a coach who forces them to think, (laughs) which would be the ideal (laughs) circumstance so that you are not forcing yourself, uh, you're not burning yourself out. So, yeah, I mean, the the cultural and societal expectations are actually huge. And I don't think um, mums or mums-to-be are actually prepared for that element of motherhood. I would agree with that in my experience. And I think as well... um, before I had a child, I was very focused on my um, my career. I really enjoyed what I did. I enjoyed the people I worked with. Don't get me wrong, I had bad days like everybody. Um, but I think, you know, I'm very dedicated in whatever I do. And, and actually, I think, you know, I was very clear that when, when I then became a mum, I still did want to work. And I think there are still um, expectations focused on women in particular around um oh so you're going to go back to work after you've had your baby yeah why would I not why wouldn't I like it's I've worked really hard to get to this point in in my career and actually like it's part of who I am as well and that's going to evolve because I am now a parent but what why would I not want to go back to work like it actually makes me a better mum in my opinion and I appreciate that's not the same for everybody and I'm not saying it should be but for me on my personal experience being able to work and have an outlet where I can enjoy what I do think about um, my purpose and making that come alive I really enjoy that and it makes me a better mum when I am with my son by the fact that I've had those experiences and I do agree as well you know I, I do think that there can be still at this point which is um disappointing a societal expectation around you know women um in terms of their role as as um lead kind of caregiver and also in terms of that more traditional view about how women return to the workplace Um, and that's just frustrating (laughs) I think it's yeah I think I mean look I can't relate to this entirely because I've not become a mum yet so I cannot um relate to the experiences I can only ever uh, relate from an observation point of view and I think what I will offer is what I consistently observe with those around me who whether it be friends or peers colleagues who have gone through the experience of becoming pregnant being pregnant at work and then returning after maternity leave is the pressure of expectation, both in terms of what they put on themselves as well as what other people uh, put on them externally. Because I don't think 
anyone really talks enough about what the clearly obvious change that's occurred in that you know you were solo and you are now <laughs> you are now you Not. now have a permanent <laughs> fixture um you know yes by all by and it's now external from you because you've given birth to it but you know you've taken on a whole new responsibility uh, a huge life responsibility this isn't just a small thing yeah. um that is now let's hope always going to be with you I don't know whether you feel that way, Susie, on the story you've got to tell us. Um, but, but the fact is, I don't think that gets acknowledged enough either. I don't think the, the woman themselves is encouraged to think about that enough, about, well, what does this now mean for you? How uh, are, you, are you wanting to now manage your work life, your role, your you know, persona in work now that you've gone through this change, which I think, I mean, realistically, it possibly can only ever happen after the event anyway, because I think it should be encouraged throughout the pregnancy period because, it, it, you know, in terms of let's have this conversation, let's make this conversation normal, let's support you to be thinking about this, you know, as early as possible so you have the time to reflect mm. in a way. But clearly it's not going to come into force until you're actually in the position where you've had the baby and you're thinking about returning to work if that's what you would like. Because, you know, the the fact is the events happened, you're clear about how you're feeling about it. But neither is, I think, the conversation had on the other side of this with, you know, the line manager, the organisation, the team to all prepare for the fact that this individual, the situation has changed. So how are we going to now incorporate this into what we're doing how do we support them with that how do we all align about what this means going forward because I see so many women come back to the workplace without any of that kind of acknowledgement the only acknowledgement being she's going from five days to four yeah I mean that is literally like the most common yeah. thing I hear yeah and but no one talks about oh right so what does that now mean for this person what does that mean for us how are we going to support them with this because actually I see too many women coming back to the workplace as pretty much as they left yeah and then coming back but now they just do four days yeah but nothing really changes and and that's where I see the the huge uh, pressure being put on the individual both what they put on themselves because um, they haven't been supported to really think about it and and what it means, and then the pressure that actually is around them uh, from you know the organisation, their peers, their line manager, which is well, she's just coming back, she's just going to carry on the same. Yeah, but it's not that's not right, and I and that's when I've seen you know my some of my closest peers, my closest colleagues, just go into a space of. Um, you know, high stress, exhaustion, burnout, they end up leaving. I yeah. mean, that that's that's the most common thing I've seen is that women have actually just gone, do you know what? I can't do both. And I've decided that actually, you know, the this isn't worth it for me anymore. You know, and I'm not going to put myself through this or my family. So they just leave, which yeah. I think is the saddest, it most is. tragic part of it, which is it's so sad that it has gone that far. It gets to that point. Um and that's yeah. exactly what ends up causing that. That's the motherhood penalty, essentially, mm. where, you know, women experience the um, financial disadvantages um, of, of carrying and having a baby, which is, you know, they there are career breaks that impact their, their finances. There are um, the, the need to look for flexible roles within your workplace to accommodate looking after a child. And then there's all the bias discrimination um, that happens in the workplace as a result of having a child and all of that. Um, when you, And then you've got the cost of childcare and some women will sit there and weigh it all up and it doesn't make any economic yeah. sense yeah. to continue. Um, and, and that is the biggest contributor to the overall gender pay gap. But, you know, what you said about, um, you know, you're not seeing enough of, sort of line managers and, and organizations taking taking some initiative there. I've, I've read quite a lot of gender pay gaps over the pandemic pay gap reports and more and more organizations are introducing um, maternity coaching. And interestingly, they are doing it, they're covering it from the point of pregnancy. Yep. So pre prenatal, um, they're keeping in touch with you on your mat leave and then they do something with you after mat leave. I don't know the specifics of all the, you know, how, how they're implementing yeah. it. And 
I'm sure for some, it's more of a tick box exercise to be able to say, yes, we offer, you know, maternity coaching. I, I don't know the depth that they go into, how supportive they are. But the, the issue that I have with that is actually your responsibilities and your challenges as a mother do not end, you know, after your child turns one. Um, you know, the, this idea that, you know, maternity coaching is to, to support the, the, the mum around the time of, of, of a newborn baby. You know, if anything, certainly my children are now 12 and nine and what I've experienced, sorry, not to put you off Susie or upset you in any way. <laughs> my experience is that the challenges change. They don't get easier. They what? just, they <laughs> just change. You have different, uh. cha- you have different <laughs> challenges to deal with. So actually, you know, having supporting working mothers beyond this kind of maternity period yeah is in my opinion quite important because they are making up a significant proportion of the workforce um and they are the ones who are going to say at some point if they're not acknowledged and supported you know what I'm going to leave. I'm going to go somewhere else. I'm going to retrain. I'm going to set up my own business. I can make it work differently. It's them that are leaving. It isn't actually the women that just have come back off mat leave. Um, So I think we, you know, they need to, organizations need to be more long sighted Mm -hmm. about how they support working mothers there's a lot of emphasis on you know reducing the gender pay gap by having women that are already at the top move even higher up the top and that yep that does great things for your gender pay gap figures but in reality you're not sustaining a a, a pipeline of female talent that way you need to be working lower down the the hierarchy and um and yes it's great they've got maternity coaching in there but what about everybody else that falls in between Mm. those two ends of that spectrum and and that is there's huge potential in the women there huge potential Mm. um and it's a missed opportunity to to be supporting them it's interesting I remember years ago I coached uh, a lady who had returned back from maternity leave after her second child and was struggling with her confidence in her role now that she was back. And it fundamentally, it boiled down to the fact that she truly believed she could do more and wanted to progress to take more responsibility and become part of the, you know, uh, the, the management team in this particular department but her perception was that she simply wasn't able to because she had children Mm -hmm. and it was I I remember working with her around this and it was simply a fabrication of her own belief that actually that just wasn't going to be possible because of her you know the culture we worked in the management level, especially the females, predominantly in her eyes, were not mothers and were able to work all the hours and work full time. And therefore that meant that they were more deserving of that, that they were more capable than she was. And it was, it was, it was actually a really sad situation. Like I felt sad for her that that was her belief system and that actually that's, in many ways what the culture we were working in was like if anything reinforcing I mean actually what what the outcome of that was was actually we coached her to go for the interview for the position that came up and she got it which I think dispelled and disproved all those thoughts beliefs you know and in many ways the myths but it was that it was from a observation point of view from someone you know watching this individual who was so capable pretty much tell herself yeah but I won't be able to do that because I am a mum and and I think she was struggling heavily with that change in identity and I and again that's something I see often with mothers returning to the workers who am I now yeah because I'm a mum and that's obviously a massive change that that, that, that's occurred there like a huge change yeah um and just you know just because you're a word doesn't mean that that goes away clearly um but definitely struggling with that identity piece of who am I now 
and who do I want to be and how do I want to be perceived um, in work now? But then also <laughs> with that sort of battle of, I think it probably comes back to what you said, Sally, earlier around that societal view of, um, you know, what women can and can't do. Uh, and and that's, that's part of working out, um, you know, <laughs> what do I want? You know, what is my vision of success? You know, this idea of having it all, we talk about having it all, can you have it all? And what does have it all mean for working mums? And, you know, back in the 1950s, it was quite a a bit easier. You just, you know, got married, stayed home, majority of women, not all. Um, We then shift into, well, women, women can have it all. And I think that created an additional pressure because actually, Mm -hmm a lot of women are quite happy to not have this idea, society's idea of having it all. Um, I think we all need to understand what our own idea of having it all. So, so yeah, there's there's a, a lot to working mums. It's complex. <laughs> yeah, no, it really is. And how, so building off that then, how do you think the pandemic has changed things for working mums in particular? Because I know there's been a lot of um, kind of coverage, maybe not enough, but a lot of coverage around um, the gender pay gap increasing during the pandemic. Um, also, I know um, on Instagram, we've we've shared a few things from um, Mother Pucker, like she's a massive um, campaigner and advocate for kind of flexible working and, and also supporting uh, mums in the workplace. How do you think the pandemic has changed things for, for mums? Oh, do you know, they've definitely borne the brunt of it. Um, and, and all the stats show that. So that's not just women moaning over a cup of coffee about how they've had to do more than their partners. You know, the, the stats <laughs> the stats quite clearly support the fact that women have been disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. And I think lots of women have um, reflected, particularly those that were able to be on furlough. There was a lot of reflection time mm. there. Lots of people did you know, apply for different things. You know, we hear about the great resignation now, don't we, where up to 40% of employees mm. could be looking for for work elsewhere. I think women of, you know, but not just women, actually, men um, very much have realised the bonus of being at home, um, seeing more of their family. And it is already cause it you can you know lots of stuff I read on LinkedIn you can see how lots of people are getting anxious about the return to work mm. and the and lifestyle going back to how it was um not everywhere is is offering hybrid I hope I hope it is an option for as many people as possible but I think I think the pandemic has shown people that there's a different way of doing things I think the pandemic has also, to some extent, reassured organisations that people can be left to work at home and, you know, they can be trusted to do the job. My concern would be that we very, very quickly revert to old ways and forget those lessons. Um, And that that would be an absolute shame. And I think it's down to grassroots workers to to really push that agenda, because I think it's it could very easily revert to to how it was yeah. if people don't push that. I don't think organisations are going to necessarily happily say to everybody, you know what, yeah, you can work flexibly, you can work from home, you can do less meetings, this, that and the other. I think it needs to be driven by people at grassroots level. Yeah, um, I, I think there's definitely, the pandemic has definitely demonstrated to employers that, flexible working and working from home you know the 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 ability to choose where you work can actually one work in respect of the operation can continue and their businesses can continue but actually also that it does have benefits for them as well you know so many organizations I think have had had well they've been forced to review their financial uh, spend on certain elements of the workplace you know including the, the building the facilities and, and 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 benefited from the savings from that if they've made changes to support people to work from home but I think whereas before I think there was always that debate around people's effectiveness from working from home there's always been that ongoing you know discussion on 
how much do people really actually work when they're at home? You know, can we, tr- you know, that word trust, which I hate using because it feels too, str- it feels a bit too strong, but yeah. that is the word, isn't it? Like, can we trust people to do a good job if we can't see them? You know, well, they were forced to have to because everyone was working from home. I think they can't, employers can't shy away from that conversation any longer because so many people have worked from home for 18 months now and organizations have survived so it is totally possible I just want to um build on what you said before Sally around some of the challenges from working mums do you think it's different for working dads those challenges um so I think you have to look at it right from the beginning so if you think even trying to get pregnant. Okay, if you if you start right from the beginning, a lot yeah. of women are changing their lifestyle in order to get pregnant. Yeah. They then carry this baby for nine months and there is a duty of care to this unborn child. And with that comes all sorts of medical anxieties and complications. Okay. You know, women may need to come off certain medications in order to be successfully pregnant and all the rest of it. So there is there's angst getting pregnant. Yeah. There's angst being pregnant. You then have you then have a baby and then there's all the stigma of do you breastfeed do you not breastfeed can you breastfeed and all the rest of it that is all before you even take into account society's expectations of you as a working mother so that all of that is on the mum none of that is on the dad at this point so in terms of are the challenges different from the get-go the challenges are different okay um i appreciate not you know that might be a controversial statement to make, but but the reality is biologically, the challenges are different <laughs> right from the start. In terms of afterwards, once they're in work, um, I mean, there's all sorts of data out there that shows that, you know, um, the motherhood penalty kicks in for, for, for mums after having babies, but, you know, dads seem to get a pay rise on the whole. Um, so th- there are, there are, differences in terms of well how much time am I going to take out how um how frequent um if I go back to a part-time how frequent am I going to go uh, will I work um and then the hours the extra hours that you do the unpaid labor that you do so this comes back down to your setup at home mm-hmm. um and gender equality in the workplace will be accelerated by sorting out gender equality at home. And we might all think that, you know, we live in a in a very um, fair environment at home. But I suspect if you really dug deep, um, there are areas where we could all improve gender equality at home within our relationships and, and within the sort of domestic duties that we, we take on at home. And and I think if we change that at home, we will have more male advocates in the workplace um, for us, which will make the challenges easier. It will pave the way for more equality at work. But, you know, that, that requires a lot of reflection on the part of mums, a lot of assertive discussion um, with partners at home, but also children your children, mm. if they're old enough for you to be setting boundaries with them and um, explaining that actually as a mum, yes, you have a duty to provide a happy and safe environment for them to grow, but you also have a duty to yourself to grow yourself. You know, your living your values shouldn't be at, at the expense of your personal and professional growth. So you have to have these conversations with children that when they're old enough to have these conversations we've done family meetings Lisa knows about this Um, (laughs) one of our family meetings went on for two hours and the kids loved it you know my husband was asleep at the end of it all (laughs) but but my my you know my my daughter and my son were looking for loopholes in everything that we were saying and you know they were standing up and sort of presenting their view of the world and their expectations and their arguments and it was a great it was a great experience we all had a giggle and a debate and but I mean you can make these discussions fun you can make these boundary settings fun um and they're great life skills for the kids as well but just 
I think a lot of people think they're having that dialogue because they're thinking about it in their head. But that's a one way dialogue with a lot of assumptions. Mm. You need to be having two way open conversations about what is going on at home, because what goes on at home impacts how your children will behave. And we are just perpetuating inequalities in the workplace if we don't sort it out at home. Mm. And they're often very subtle things, but there's, I'm sure most households have room to improve um, boundaries at home. Yeah, that's an interesting perspective. When I, I've certainly not really kind of considered before, so that was really interesting to hear. So let's just focus a bit more on you, because I know you've, as we've mentioned, transitioned your career you are very passionate and, and, you know, you're very inspired to focus on supporting working mums in your coaching work. As a working mum yourself, what's been your experience of, of being a working mum and balancing that challenging career, those pressures that come with it? What's been your experience of that? Oh, it's hard work. I was a lot slimmer when the, <laughs> when the kids were younger because it was so much hard work. Um, <laughs> Yeah, now I can sit down a little bit more. Um, oh, I'm jealous. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, my experiences. I mean, it's difficult because it's tainted by the fact that I was in a career that I wasn't really enjoying. And so um, I often wonder how I would have approached um, working motherhood differently had I been enjoying what I do. Okay. Um, so I think I'd, I'd have to sort of put that out there because I will have a very kind of skewed, skewed perspective in that respect. Um, I think it's hard. It's hard. You know, we um, my husband did so much because of the hours that I was doing. So I, I chose to drop down to three days a week. I, I couldn't even do four. I felt that that was that was too much. Um, I dropped to three. I went to four, I think, after one child and went to three after two. And um, and the problem is you try to do so much in your days on to compensate yeah. for your days off that yeah. actually in terms of the hours you're putting in, I was close to putting in full time hours anyway. Yeah. But I was getting that. I was getting paid for three days a week, which yeah. causes this underlying level of resentment, which is mm. just not healthy. It's just mm. not healthy at all. It's not a great starting place. And and it wasn't acknowledged. And I think. I think that would have relieved a lot of the burden if if the hours that I was putting in um, could have just been acknowledged at least, you know. Um, and so- Sally, sorry to interrupt you there, but I think this is this comes back to that point I was saying earlier that I think is all too common. I see it with my friends as well, which is you know this this fixation on doing the same in less time. Yeah. Where does that come from, do you think? So I think there's um, a, a couple of places. I think um, if I've read so many books about sort of social conditioning and the, the, the different ways in which boys and girls are socially conditioned from early on. And the studies, you know, go back to sort of age, they can see differences from ages three, uh, three and onwards. Girls are socialised to be perfect, you know, that's a really sweeping statement, but just just so that people can understand where I'm going with this. Mm. Boys are socialized to have a go, be brave. It doesn't matter if it's not perfect, you just have a go. Um, And I think this perfectionism follows us um, in life and it follows us in the workplace and it follows us in our parenting. And we we struggle with um, being good enough Um, on the whole, not everybody but on the whole and certainly in my coaching perfectionism is a recurring a recurring theme Mm -hmm. Um, interesting they're not necessarily always aware of it until you highlight it they they will say things like it's high standards they have high standards and and I used to do this I used to justify my high standards you know people don't have my standards but actually um you just have to learn and I have I think that's one thing that I have done since having kids you don't have the time to keep striving for perfection it's actually an obstacle to strive for perfection Mm. you've just got to work out 
what is good enough for you as a person mm. and what is good enough for the task that you're doing at the time yeah and, and I you- think I think that's an incredible lesson for anyone in general because I think I'm terribly guilty of exactly what you're talking about that's not related to you know anything other than who I am as a person and how I've grown and how I've been encouraged and supported to be um because I think I've always been in very competitive female environments as well yeah and I think you know right through from my own family unit I'm one of three girls you know yeah. and I'm the eldest so obviously I'm the better I'm the better one anyway but um <laughs> But, you know, and then I went to a primary school where girls were celebrated and then I went to an all girls grammar school. So and then I've got an incredible group of friends who are all girls and who are all strong and successful. But I think there's even a level of competition within that, not in a vicious way, but there's still that in that we all maintain the standard of living. But I think it's all buoyed up and and supported by each other because we all just want to be the best at whatever we can be at all times, whether that's socially, you know, career wise, whatever. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that's so true about trying to identify what is good enough for you as an individual yeah. and, you know, living to that and yeah. being comfortable with that. But yeah. that's really hard. <laughs> that, I mean, that takes quite a lot to think it, about, put together and then even stay committed to living with that and being happy with it. Do you know what? You, and have, I think, uh, you have to start small, really. Yeah. Small. yeah. I was going to say, because actually you don't have the time, the capacity to, I would love to have like a, just even half a day where I could kind of ask or pose those questions to myself, yep. but I don't have that luxury anymore. Yep. And I have, you know, I'm very grateful and, 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 you know, um, to have my little boy, but it's bloody hard. Like it's yep. really hard work and, you know, it's, finding defining what that success is Mm -hmm. for for you and whether you're a mum or a dad actually like that work you know defining that success is absolutely you know really important but it's it is hard to do like I think being realistic about it um you know finding that space to really like dedicate that time can be challenging I guess if I was gonna come at it in terms of um advice what would I be advising you to to be thinking of I created um, an infographic months ago when it was international coaching day and I stand by what I put on there which is life is not a rehearsal your health is not guaranteed and happiness is not a destination and if you have those three things in the back of your mind if life is not a rehearsal you've got one chance So Mm. how are you going to step out of your comfort zone? Because you've got one chance. Your health isn't guaranteed. So how are you going to look after yourself? And happiness isn't a destination. You have got to enjoy the journey along the way. You don't know when that journey is going to end. So you've got to enjoy every step of it. So I guess if I was advising how to consider success, I would consider you consider those questions. Yeah. Um, but, But define your own success because it's very depressing to be living up to somebody else's standards and not your own yeah we'll share that infographic if you're happy for us to on our instagram page um so to support and and kind of aid the follow-up from from um this episode so we've talked a lot about the current situation some of the current challenges how the pandemic has exasperated a lot of that in in particular for working mums so I suppose now I just like to have a think about how we move forward and what are potentially some of the solutions to the problems currently facing, I suppose, working mums in particular at Mm. at this point. Have you got any ideas on on that at all? So, again, from reading gender pay gap reports, you can see all the great things that organisations have implemented. You've got now shared parental leave, even though from what I understand, only a quarter of couples are actually eligible for that. And then even from that, only 4% of people are taking up because it doesn't make economical sense. So, you know, there needs to be some work on that, but at least that's a start. A lot of organisations have enhanced their maternity leave and paternity leave offerings, which is great. There are childcare schemes for some places. Um, There's um, maternity coaching as well. Again, I don't know how... um, how well that works but at least it's an offering and then and then there's sort of leadership coaching which we've talked about for for women a bit further up that ladder um but in terms of other solutions what I would really like to see and what I 
am quite passionate about and have piloted is, is I want group coaching for professional working mums in organisations because we've already mentioned how a big chunk of the gender pay gap is due to the motherhood penalty. So it makes sense that we have a motherhood offering um, that helps to address that. And I think, you know, we need something that is cost effective, something that is sustainable, something that is accessible. And one to one coaching is is not it's not easy. Yeah. It, and it's not going to have massive impact at scale. But something like group coaching can um, women will feel better knowing that they're not alone, that they can mm. share their experiences, particularly if they work in male dominated environments. Group coaching for, for women would be amazing. Um, but also just the opportunity to to mix it up a bit you know we talk so much about inclusion in the workplace and you have an opportunity with group coaching to mix it up so you're not just getting women of different personal backgrounds but you bring them in from different parts and levels of an organization so that group coach coaching group is not consisting of people that know each other but only people that do not know each other, people that bring different perspectives. And so you've got that collective wisdom there. You've got the opportunity for networking within that group. You've got the opportunity for creating advocates and allies for yourself within and as a result of that group. And I I really want to push that agenda because I think that will work. And um, certainly with the group that I'm piloting at the moment, they're loving it. I can see improvements. They've all grown. Um, And I think just having that shared, um, the one shared characteristic that they all have is that they're working moms. Yeah. And they bond purely as a result of that. So their their connections are all from scratch. And it's really nice to see how they all support each other and collaborate together to make it work. And there's so much evidence that shows women thrive so much more in collaborative settings that it would be a shame to not see something like this be taken on by organizations because I, I personally think it will make a difference but yeah. um, that's my personal perspective I think that's a really good perspective and also just to build on that I think because some of our listeners as well own their own businesses they might not work in a big organization actually that's something that you could replicate fairly easily with just a couple of people if you are a smaller team you don't need to have a big uh group of people you can do that in in a fairly small size team as well is that right yeah absolutely absolutely there's you know it can be tailored and however you want and and that's that's the beauty of it you know as long as there's willingness at the top for people to consider it because it is a different way and from what I can see organizations seem to implement what other organizations are doing no one really wants to kind of be the first to try out something so <laughs> out there but perhaps that's where smaller organizations come in that, that can make that decision and tailor it and create a case study out of it um but but yeah it's it's flexible and the, and the point is that women bring whatever's going unlike training where if you go to training you are there's a set curriculum perhaps to teach the thing about something like a a group coaching program is it's flexible and it's relevant so women bring in whatever the challenges are for them at the moment and you know so many group coaching conversations will come out of that one individual challenge that they bring to the session and everyone will have perspectives on it and everyone will learn from it Um, Mm -hmm. So it's, um, I think it's the way forward. <laughs> yeah, I think small businesses can really lead the way there with that and, and be innovative, you know, show um, a different kind of solution in, in practice and have that agility to be able to do that quite quickly, um, which is really exciting. So we ask all our guests at the um, kind of concluding part to share their top tips um, for our listeners. So we just wondered what your top tips or recommendations bit might be for working parents out there who want to achieve um, balance, but also want to continue to strive to have a successful career as well. Big question there. <laughs> oh, okay, so, so pick three, number one, Sally, pick three. I know, pick three. Number one, just stop, get out of the fast lane and just think. Just stop to give yourself that luxury to just think. And it really is a luxury. Um, So I would do that, um, firstly. Secondly, be assertive. You've got to have those conversations and practice at home. 
with your partner, with your children, because that's a, that's a safe place to practice putting it out there. What is it that you need? What is it that you want? How are you going to go about negotiating it? How can you improve how effective you are at negotiating that? Um, and then take it from there into the workplace. But home is a great safe space to practice asking for what you need and want. And lastly, how are you going to enjoy it? Because your kids grow up so quickly and you don't want your memory to be, you, you don't want your sort of working parenthood memory to be one of stress. You need to find a way of setting those boundaries, enjoying yourself whilst you progress. It's that yeah, that would be my top three. Brilliant. They're fantastic. Uh, thank you so much for those. Uh, the third top tip I'm certainly going to take <laughs> away and have a think about after my uh, week last week, that's for sure. Um, thank you so much, Sally, for joining us on the coaching cast. I could have, I could speak to you again for like another few hours on this topic. <laughs> There's so much to talk about and we've kind of crammed it into a fairly short conversation, but um, there's some really interesting stuff there and some different perspectives that I know as a working mum, I certainly had considered previously um so thank you so much you're very welcome lovely to speak to you both thanks Ali. <laughs> it's now time for bullshit bingo where we call out phrases which get commonly used in the workplace which make us cringe today's bullshit bingo is another great one given to us by one of our instagram followers and it is capturing hearts and minds Suze, you you kick this one off. What do you think? (laughs) I absolutely love this one. Honestly, (laughs) this is such a good one. I saw it in the um, document before and I was like, that is one of my top favourite bullshit bingos. So I've not used this one. You'll be surprised to hear. (laughs) I've not used this one, but I have definitely heard it being used uh, previously. And also, I don't like its intent. Like, it really, I don't like it. Like, you're capturing my heart and my mind. They're not there to be captured, love. Like, I don't, I don't want that. Like, they're mine. Go away. Leave me alone. Don't capture it. That's not very nice. Um, so I don't like its intent. I find it a bit creepy. Um, it's really creepy. Well, as so, I said, my experience is that anyone who's ever said this is a major twat. <laughs> I don't think anyone I've ever known who's ever said this has actually ever been the sort of genuine, authentic individual who cares enough to really want to tap into what means something to you. That's why. Um, that's why I'm saying that. Yeah. I think anytime anyone's ever said it that I know of, I'm literally like, "You're a twat." Yeah, and really stop and think about what they're actually saying by saying it. Do you know what I mean? So, like, I'm capturing hearts and minds here. Like, what the hell are you talking about? Like. Again, just stop. So uh, this is honestly one of my favourites. I saw it and I thought that is an absolute classic. That it is not have before and is one of my favourites. I'm yeah. calling it now. I think you're right. I mean, it's it's early on in the third season I to know. call out a bullshit bingo already being at the top. It's only episode two. But I, I, d- I never right. thought <laughs> that triage or paradigm shift could <laughs> be topped. And I'm not saying this tops those two, but I'd say it's up there in my top three capturing hearts and minds I work for an organization I swear loved this one and as I said every person I know that I think said it had the least emotional intelligence and capability and were so wooden and actually quite (laughs) cold-hearted so the irony yeah well as I said I said it earlier twat don't be a twat, people. Don't use it. Um, keep them coming. We absolutely love getting bullshit bingos. Keep we them do. coming. You can DM us on Instagram at the coaching cast or drop us an email at hello at the coaching cast.co.uk. So we're coming to the end of today's episode where we've been speaking to the wonderful performance coach, Sally Hanna, about the challenge of working parents and how to balance both parenthood, specifically motherhood in this particular episode, and a career. So our tips from today for you to try, collated between ourselves and inspired hugely by Sally, are firstly, stop 
and create space to think. So I know from the conversations we've just had, time is so, so precious for working parents. So it's really about committing to making that time and sticking to it. Just start with 30 minutes. doesn't have to be very long, 15 minutes if you're short, but any time is enough time to really give yourself some focus. So number two is think about what you really want and what good looks like, both for you in work and at home. So what does good look like for you in your role in the workplace, in your career, even if you're an entrepreneur or a single business owner, as well as what good looks like at home in your other role as a parent? Number three, be assertive. Sally loved this one. So be assertive. I thought this was a great idea. I don't need to be more assertive. I think we've gathered from today's episode. No, I think you should. I want assertive Sue's to be out. (laughs) Um, So yeah, be assertive and start at home with your family. So I thought this was a really interesting one from Sally. So use that opportunity within your home environment, within your home team to practice talking about and asking for what you really want to then take into your job. And then lastly, but by no means least, enjoy it. So make time to have fun as a parent, as a family, and also at work as well. So don't worry, you don't need to remember all of these tips now, as all of these will be available on our Instagram page at The Coaching Cast this week. So as well as these top tips, also try asking yourself the following questions. If you're a working mother or father, this is applicable to both parents, really consider what your boundaries are. What will you and will you not do or sacrifice? And then also, what does success look like for you? So this will really help with that top tip when you're giving yourself time. So ask yourself as a mother, as a father and as a successful career person, what success looks like. Write a list down of what that looks like, feels like, sounds like. So as we said, although this episode has been heavily focused on mums, it really is very much applicable to working dads as well. We hope you enjoyed today and have some new ideas to take away and try for yourselves. If you have any questions, thoughts or feedback, we would love to hear from you. And you can contact us at hello at thecoachingcast.co.uk or on Instagram at thecoachingcast. Your support means everything as always. Therefore, if you like what you've heard, then give us a follow on Instagram at The Coaching Cast. Leave us a review on Apple and Google Podcasts. And most importantly, subscribe to future episodes wherever you listen. And also, don't forget, we are on YouTube where you can watch us in action. You can watch these episodes in life <laughs> and simply just search The Coaching Cast. In next week's episode, we are discussing the topic of how to prioritise effectively, something which at times I think we all need some help with. So make sure you stay tuned for that episode. We both love music and we use it to motivate and energise us. So we like to finish each episode with our personal song recommendation, giving you positivity and energy as you launch into your next meeting. It's my choice this week and I have gone Ibiza Disco. So you can obviously see what I'm craving. Um, So I've chosen the song Missing by The Vision featuring Andrea Triana and Ben Westbeach. Go boogie on down. Enjoy that one. It's a banger. I've been listening to it nonstop all week. So yes, thanks very much for listening to this episode of The Coaching Cast. Have a great week. And remember, you've got this. (laughs) 